tell me a little bit more about this project and why it was so important to you yeah, to fund. Absolutely. Well, I really think that this represents our climate policy at work, which is our you know our our whole approach to climate policy is that you don't have to trade off jobs, the environment, and really good just outcomes for communities. So what we're doing here is that we have acquired federal funds to construct a training facility so people can learn the skills necessary to build the underwater pylons that offshore wind turbines go on top of. These are really good, high paying, very often union jobs. And we're doing it at a public college, SUNY Maritime, in the Bronx so that the communities that have been most impacted by the front lines and injustices of the climate crisis can now get the jobs in solving them. And so we're really excited about this. This is going to create so many jobs for folks in our community at high dignified pay. And when this project is all done, still a little work to go, what is it going to be doing exactly? It's going to be, some of these facilities for example are like uh, deep pools and people will be putting on uh, scuba equipment in order to figure out how you construct pylons underwater. Mm -hmm. And as they develop those skills, they'll be able to partner with apprenticeships and union programs so that when the funding comes in, through the, whether it's the Inflation Reduction Act or other types of federal funding, to construct offshore wind turbines, these folks are going to be the first in line to get those jobs. You're still a part of a new generation of leaders in Congress. Mm -hmm. You've been there now for a couple of years. Who gives you hope in the Democratic Party as you look around at fellow members or other leaders around the country? I am so excited and energized by the evolution of grassroots and community organizations and the extent of their involvement. Um, historically in Washington, it's been a lot of, of very established institutions and advocacy organizations that have had a seat at the table. But now we're seeing this explosion in grassroots organizing that is starting to cross the threshold into real influence and in policy making. And that to me is beyond inspiring. Is there an organization or a new colleague or someone people should know about that you're excited about? Yeah, I mean, I think groups like, like Sunrise and, and many others are so exciting. In terms of my colleagues, this new freshman class is phenomenal. I have the honor of being the vice, the vice ranking chair under Jimmy Raskin for the Oversight Committee. And we just have amazing freshmen in our class from Becca Ballant, who's the first woman to be elected in the state of Vermont, Maxwell Frost, the first Gen Z member of Congress. We have folks like Greg Kassar and Summer Lee that really represent communities that are from like, you know, steel production and in, in Pittsburgh and all of these amazing communities, but they're bringing a vibrancy and showing that the kind of representation that we didn't even think was possible in some places actually is. And so that to me is really inspiring. So you're in the minority in Congress for the first time since you were elected. Mm -hmm. It seems like you're kind of having fun being a bit of an <laughs> agitator. Uh, are you enjoying that role? I think holding those in power accountable is a fundamental part of, of our role. And it's, it's a part of a role that I draw on from my history in advocacy and organizing and activism. But it's also one where we can propose solutions while we're also holding people accountable for the decisions that they're making. And so, yeah, I think it's been a it's it's been an important role for us to play. So you're also a pretty politically astute observer. There is a presidential race that's <laughs> happening right now. Donald Trump, people think some say is the easiest person for Joe Biden to run against. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Well, the easiest potential Republican nominee, yeah. I should say. I think there's something to be said about that. The, the dynamics of these races change from day to day. I think that uh, Governor DeSantis has made some very large critical errors, and I think he's weaker than... What are his biggest errors, do you think, as you've watched? Well, you can't out-Trump Trump, right? And that's what he's really been trying to do. His attacks on teachers, on schools, on LGBT Americans, I think 
go way too far in the state of Florida. Um, and I think that they are a profound political miscalculation and an overcompensation. Um, he may be trying to win a base, but that base belongs to Donald Trump. And he has sacrificed, I think, the one thing that others may have thought would make him competitive, which is this idea that he would somehow be more rational than Donald Trump, which he isn't. Now, you're very familiar with surprising people and winning a primary. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone in the Republican field, you would disagree with them completely on policy issues, but that you think maybe they have something or maybe they could take on Trump? It is early in the process. You know, I think in the House, I see the dynamics and the political dynamics in the House very often mirror some of the political dynamics happening out in the country. And I think right now the Republican Party is so disorganized that I really don't see someone that can unite that party even beyond Donald Trump. And so, to be honest, I don't because the individuals that have wanted to appeal to people's cooler senses in the party have all been driven out. Every, every Republican who voted for impeachment has been... It's no longer there. no longer there. And so I, I really struggle to find anybody that can both accomplish that task and unite their party. So you have developed this reputation. I don't know if you like this or not, as a firebrand. <laughs> yeah. What do people get wrong about you or not know about you? Um, I think very often when I meet with colleagues or individuals that I had not met with before, um, they are surprised that I do my homework a lot. <laughs> I know when I had my first hearing. Are you a in the little house. nerdy, and people don't know oh, this? Oh no, absolutely <laughs> a little. <laughs> no, I think um, yeah. It's like when I had my first hearing with Michael Cohen, people were surprised that I tried to ask substantive questions. Mm -hmm. But I think that there is this idea that you somehow can't both be an effective communicator and discuss and challenge the bounds of our political imagination on substantive grounds. And I think we can do both, and I think we should do both. So I know you're not gonna talk about 10 to 15 years from now. I don't know what I'm doing 10 to 15 years from now, but in five years, are you gonna be in Congress? I mean, we maybe, you know, I think um, I've always tried to approach my service in a way of what really I think would be best for people. And if it would be best for me to continue my service, um, then I will. If it's best for me to continue my service in a, in a different form, then I hope to do that like as well. Like in the Senate, for example. <laughs> <laughs> so if you were not in Congress, because you're passionate about a lot of things, mm -hmm. what would you be doing? I think, I mean, before I ever even thought about being in Congress, I've always been passionate about teaching and writing. And so maybe I would have been a teacher. No, you never know. Life you is never long. Know. I, exactly. <laughs>